This time we're covering Nintendo Power issue 42 for November of 1992. Now as of this recording, a fairly full archive of Nintendo Power magazine is up on the Internet Archive at archive.org, in addition to being av available through Retromag, so I'll be putting links in the show notes with the locations for where you can find this issue if you'd like to read along. Now we've got a bunch of titles this issue, including a few titles getting ported from one Nintendo platform to another. Let's get started. Our cover game for this issue is Super Star Wars, with a cover featuring a way too cropped still of Darth Vader's helmet. You can tell it's cropped in just a close-up, because you can kind of see the grain of the film on the cover, which normally when you're doing photography for a cover of a magazine, you don't see. Before we get into the issue proper, we have one of Nintendo's advertisements for their own products towards the beginning of the issue, showing the sports lineup for the Super NES. In the letters column, various readers have responded to a prompt on what they do when they're not playing video games. Of note, one of the readers is studying Klingon and gives a translation of the phrase the Mario Brothers rule in Klingon. Unfortunately, for some reason, whoever put the letter in here, removed all the spaces from the text, as far as the Klingon phrase, so it's hard to tell where one word begins and the other ends if you don't already know Klingon. If you are a listen, a viewer and you do know Klingon, please put the appropriate translation with spaces in the show notes, and in the next episode I will happily give the um, say it aloud. Moving on to our first game of the issue, we have a port of Joe and Mac for the NES. The graphics are not as flashy as the SNES version, obviously, but the gameplay appears unchanged. The article gives maps of the first five stages. Joe and Mac does not play as well on the NES. The characters have less, well, character to them with less expressive sprites. Now, that's to be expected with the memory difference of the cartridges. But there's also a weird side effect to this. The hitboxes for the bosses are wonky. It feels like the sprite for the hitbox of the bosses around their heads is smaller than the hitbox was in the Super Nintendo version due to the limitations of the hardware. However, the gameplay is very clearly designed to emulate the Super Nintendo version as closely as possible, to the point where the game is using the same boss patterns as the SNES version and is designed with the intent to use those tactics, but those tactics don't work because of the reduced size of the hitbox. So, consequently, I'd say stick with the Super Nintendo version over the NES version. It's probably easier to find anyway. Next up is Crash and the Boys Street Challenge. This game began its life in Japan as a spin-off of the Kunio Kun games, but for this release, the connection to River City Ransom has been effectively removed. The article, article gives a rundown of each of the power-ups you can buy from the shops, as with River City Ransom, along with tips for each event. Crash of the Boys Street Challenge is, in short, yet another track and field game, except with some dirty tricks thrown into the mix because we're dealing with the characters from the Kunio Kun slash River City Ransom games. As the Konami's track and field, these games can be fun in multiplayer, but can also be a real chore to beat in single player, particularly when you're dealing with a computer that doesn't face the physical limitations of button mashing. I would call this, frankly, a solid two-player-only experience. We have something of a rerun here, with a guide for the first Mega Man game, which had previously been covered in the magazine. As opposed to the earlier guide, this one covers the entire game from beginning to end, including Dr. Wily's Castle. Since we've already covered this game all way back in episode 15, I'll link to that episode in the show notes. It kind of goes to show that we're approaching the end of the NES's life here, where 
in order to kind of fill out the NES section of the magazine, we're rerunning and expanding guides for earlier games. In the classified information column, we have some information on secret warps for Magic Sword, and a hidden options menu that will let you boost your health, and pick up on any level you've previously reached on in this in this session, since this is a game that doesn't support um, saves through battery backup. We also have information on the hidden power-up room in Super Castlevania 4. In the Link to the Past comic, Link has rescued Zelda, and now Ganon awaits. Moving on to Game Boy titles, we have another platformer based on the Hanna-Barbera sitcom from the 70s, this time for the Game Boy. The article gives notes, but not maps for the first five stages. My suspicion why we're getting this now is... Well, I believe we're getting the Flintstones live-action movie around this time, so that may be relating to that. As much as LJN is a sign of dread for the angry video game nerd, so is the logo for Ocean for me, particularly when you're dealing with the platformer. Now to give credit where credit is due, Ocean, who notoriously has floaty, slidey physics in their platformers, tries to juggle the balancing act of expressive sprites and an appropriately scaled camera angle, by this case slowing down the pace of the game. Theoretically, this would compensate with some of the other issues that ocean platformers have. Again, the terrible, terrible physics. Unfortunately, it doesn't. And the, the way the levels are laid out requires a bit more memorization than I'd like for a, in a platformer, particularly a Game Boy platformer, with such a zoomed-in camera angle. S still zoomed out more than other titles do, but still zoomed in too much for what I like. So, give this a pass. And in contrast for going from what's wrong with platformers on the Game Boy to what's right, we have our second Game Boy Mario title as we look at Super Mario Land 2, which this time introduces Wario as Mario's rival and frequent antagonist. We get a rundown of the game's power-ups and notes on each of the levels. At the time this issue was published, the game was out, so I'm going to cover this game now. I feel like, when Nintendo made Super Mario Land 2, they looked at all the platformers and other titles being published for the Game Boy with big, expressive sprites and a zoomed-in camera perspective that made it so you couldn't plan your actions ahead, and said, we really need to show people how to do this right. And so consequently, Super Mario Land 2 basically goes and does the perfect version of the Nintendo platformer on the Game Boy. The controls are pretty good, though I will tell say that the controls feel sadly floaty even before you get the buddy funny hat, which basically serves as this game's version of the raccoon tail. Still, its floaty physics are much better than the Flintstones floaty physics, being just slightly more amped up than the physics on the Mario Brothers NES games. And it plays just so much better. It's the fireball works the way it should. It just works really nice. It makes for one of the best games in the Game Boy thus far, and a must-have for your Game Boy library. Well, you've destroyed your controller on the NES version of Track and Field. Now it's time to test the indestructibility of the Game Boy, the Game Boy port of Track and Field, on an episode that is coming out during the 2016 Summer Olympic Games. Now how's that for timeliness? Well, Track and Field plays a lot like Konami's other Track and Field games in that it's a series of button-mashing meaning games requiring you to get the best possible performance while also nearly breaking your controller in the process and attempting to meet goals that cannot really be met without rapid fire or serious damage to your fingers. Unlike earlier games, you don't have to complete a, com a particular qualifying score to go on to the next event, which is nice, but it also ruins, to a certain degree, the fun of the game somewhat. Well, not ruins is the wrong term. It changes things so your real mark to beat, as opposed to the record, the world record times, is your personal best. And because this is a single-player game, you cannot compete with your friends for the best high scores in each event, whether directly head-to-head -head or through their scores, as Track and Field for the GB does not have two-player mode in any form, whether through the link cable or through hot swap, uh, hot passing around the Game Boy. The closest way to do this sort of competition, I would guess, would be if you have a family Game Boy and a family copy of Track and Field, and 
the personal best on the system is the family best or um, among siblings or that sort of thing, if this is a shared Game Boy or a shared cartridge. Consequently, this version of the game, more than any other version of the game, is worth a miss. Unless you are playing in a situation where you have a Retron 5 or a Super Game Boy and you're playing this among your roommates on a shared copy or a dorm in a shared environment in that way. Next is WWF Superstars 2, and I don't recall covering Superstars 1 for the Game Boy. Of the game's roster... I don't know if it's a good thing to say that only one wrestler on the roster is, as of this recording, dead in Macho Man Randy Savage. However, the rest of the wrestlers in the game's roster have retired from active wrestling, with the only one who I see wrestle with any degree of sort of regularity, The Undertaker, only returning to the ring for special appearances. This game is the worst thing a game can be. Boring. All the characters effectively control the same, with all the same moves, and none of the finishing remover maneuvers to give them any degree of difference aside from their little entrance music. You beat the crap out of each other using the same moves until the opponent's life bar is depleted and, depleted and you can pin them. To stretch the match out further, both wrestlers have a second wind, which you can perform that will replenish your health mostly to full, done by pressing the select button, which can only be done once per match. Additionally, unlike WWF programming at this point in the 90s, most of the matches are just throwing punch after punch after punch. We've started entering the era where Bret Hart is a major player, where to a certain degree Shawn Michaels is becoming a major player, Kurt Hanning, and that sort of thing. We're getting into matches where suplexes are more common, throws are more common, holds are more common. Whereas in this game, occasionally you can get in close and do a suplex, but it's far too risky in action, and suplexes don't do enough damage to be worth the risk. So, skip this game. If you want to play a wrestling game, um... Really go with the NES and some of the titles on that system, like Tecmo Pro Wrestling. In the Super Mario's Adventures comic, Mario, Luigi, and Yoshi are trying to crash the writing of Bowser and Princess Peach again. In Counselor's Corner, we have yet more questions about Link to the Past, along with questions about King's Quest. Speaking of games with quests in the title, we enter into the Super Nintendo titles with Final Fantasy Mystic Quest. Now, Square's intent behind the game was to make a gateway RPG that people unfamiliar with the genre would find approachable. I'd argue the reaction to this game is that you can't force a gateway game. Dragon Quest was intended to be more approachable than, say, Wizardry and Ultima, certainly, but the developers didn't set out on paper to make a gateway title, but ended up making one anyway. And that issue may be why King's, why um, Mystic Quest is, is not re regarded as fondly by history. Now, Final Fantasy Mystic Quest is a title that I will say, does do a decent job of trying to pare the genre of Japanese RPGs down to their mechanical essentials. It almost quite pulls it off. It cuts down grinding to the essentials of resource management, health, magic, and healing items. <clears throat> and the problem is that the key of resource management is having the ability to replenish your resources, particularly in an RPG. And the game takes a little too long to reach that opportunity where you get to replenish those resources. There's a town fairly early on, but there's no, like, inn or anything like that where your healing items replenish. I do appreciate the game lets you save anywhere, which is something that a lot of games don't. They, the JRPGs tend to limit you to save points, and because of how the game is structured, it's hard somewhat to screw yourself by saving yourself in a situation where the game is unbeatable. Otherwise, the game is structured well and handles grinding in just the right way, by letting you grind when you want to grind instead of when you don't, party sizes are small and ma but manageable, and when you automate your side party manager members, they behave in a very competent fashion, healing as needed for either themselves or you, and otherwise using appropriate attack abilities. Further, resurrection magic when cast takes you to full health, instead of a fraction of your health as in most JRPGs. Side passages generally lead you to a chest with a useful resource every single time, 
and there are plenty of ways to explore in the game while still making it so if you take the main route you're not going to be miss too much stuff. All in all, I call Final Fantasy Mystic Quest an underrated gem and definitely worth picking up. Next up is Super Star Wars. This is really the start of the Star Wars console franchise that everyone remembers fondly, as opposed to the NES titles which aren't remembered as well. This guide covers through maps and notes pretty much the whole game. Super Star Wars is a game that feels a little harder than it needs to be. It wants to be a Contra-style run-and-gun, but with a few little problems that keep it from working out that way. Contra is a game where you don't have to shoot and kill everything in order to proceed. Success in those games is knowing of what you need to kill and what to avoid. On the other hand, Super Star Wars feels like... like Metal Slug, where you need to shoot everything on screen. Because everything's attacking you and shooting at you from every angle, so if you don't kill everything, or almost everything, you're going to take too much damage in order to make it to the end of the level. With the difference being that Metal Slug also has a very rapid um, pow weapon power progression. There's generally, often, lots of POWs for you to rescue to provide power-ups. So if you die, you have a way to quickly get your power-ups back up to full. With Super Star Wars, it takes the more Contra-esque power-up system, where you get power-ups with a certain degree of regularity, but not a lot. So, you want to grab power-ups when you can. And I think a Metal Slug-esque power-up progression system would have been more in order here. However, I mean, to be fair, Metal Slug doesn't come out for another four years as of, as of this issue, so I kind of got to cut him some slack there. I stated my hopes that we'd cover some of the Super Nintendo shoot 'em ups in the magazine, and we have an article covering two such titles, Space Megaforce and Axley. Both ti titles get power-up notes and information on the game's levels. Space Megaforce is a shooter that really feels like it pushes the NES to its limits with the sheer amount of stuff on screen, with the Death Blossom level of firepower you can put out at any one time, to the massive number of enemies on screen of various sizes, and the impressive parallax scrolling, combined with a very impressive variety of power-ups that you can reconfigure at, on the fly. It makes this a fun and imposing shooter, but without getting into bullet hell territory. Axley is an interesting studer, shooter, and particularly of note in contrast with having just played and reviewed Space Megaforce. As this is a game that is definitely trying, like Space Megaforce, to showcase the potential of the Super Nintendo's hardware, in this case through the utilization of Mode 7. It works fairly well, but it's got some notable issues. In shooters like Konami's flagship shooter, Gradius, when you lose your power-ups after getting taken down, you can regain your lost power-ups by downing enemies, and the game is pretty good at giving them to you at a somewhat reasonable clip. So, when you respawn, at, when you die, there's usually a number of enemies not that far off who will pop up and give you more, bolt, more things to shoot. With Axley, when you lose a power-up after getting hit, that's it gone, at least until you, the end of the stage, or you die. It doesn't give that many power-ups over the course of the game to recharge your weapons, or re replenish your weapons. That ties in with how the weapons are also your power-ups, or rather, the weapons are also your health. You have three weapons on your ship at any one time, and as you take more, as you take damage, you lose weapons that you have equipped. This makes things somewhat frustrating because losing a good power-up can catastrophically harm the run, and having the ability to regain a power-up, any power-up, to take that slot would provide a way to recover and also encourage players to think on the fly a little bit more, but not having that kind of harms this game. Otherwise, I do kind of like this title, and I like the fact that this, like Radius 3, the game lets you customize your power-up loadout, something that more shooters should do, and hopefully I'll see more shooters do this in the future in the Super Nintendo. It is particularly note in contrast with the power-up thing, because Space Megaforce drops power-ups on you fast and furious of all different types and styles, so it's a very interesting note in contrast. Of the two, I kind of like Space Megaforce more. 
Our last Super Nintendo game of the issue is Faceball 2000, which is to my knowledge the first console first-person shooter. Doom This Ain't. To the game's credit, none of the weapons here are hit-scan weapons in that they just check to see if your cursor is over the target and counts as, as a hit. To provide a degree of skill, the game requires you to lead moving targets. And the focus of the gameplay is very heavily weighted towards skill in aiming and leading, leading your shot. And that's pretty much all the good things I have to say for this game. The walls are a very flat shape with no texture or map detail or color to them like with Wolfenstein or Doom. You only have one kind of shot as opposed to, well, Wolfenstein which has a variety of weapons and the game itself has no real character other than smiley faces shooting at each other with various different orb and teardrop type shaped shapes. Which is perhaps amusing if you're not a fan of that particular form of pot art, pop art or like to look at it in an ironic fashion. As far as console proto first person shooters are concerned though, this is very underwhel under underwhelming. In the top 20, Super well, uh, Street Fighter 2, not Super, Super's not out yet, has finally gained the top spot on the Super Nintendo at last. In Nestor's Adventures, this issue, Nestor is playing out of this world, and we get a tip on the controls for the vehicle sequence. No celebrity profile this issue, but we do have a special guest of now playing with a gentleman named Jade Hall, joining George and Rob. Mr. Hall, if you are watching this video, please get in touch. I would like to interview you. Anyway, of note, this issue is a little-known Simpsons game titled Bart vs. the Juggernauts, which appears to be inspired by American Gladiators. The Super Nintendo also has Battle Clash for the Super Scope, and we get information on Phalanx, which you may know as the shooter with the inexplicable hillbilly on the cover. No import coverage in Packwatch this time, but we do get our first mention of the Super FX chip here, along with coverage of Mickey's Magical Quest. My pick of the issue this time, and this is a very clear pick, is Super Mario Land 2. It's another solid inclusion to the Game Boy's library, and definitely a superior to the original Super Mario Land. On the two-player front, I'm going with uh, Crash and the Boys, due to how it puts a subversive layer of humor underneath your standard track and field game, making it a much more fun experience than just your standard Konami track and field game, particularly for a two-player playing with your buddies. Once again, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe to this channel. Subscribe and get you notified when future episodes come out. And liking lets me know that you enjoyed the episode. The video on the right will be of the previous episode of Nintendo Power Retrospectives, if you want to go see what I reviewed previously that on that show. And the video on the left will take you to the previous episode of Breaking It All Down, while well, you'll get to see what I covered there. And below that will be a link to my Patreon page if you wish to back the show. Backing the show can get you a mention in the credits, and also, depending on your level of support, you can determine what I do future Let's Plays of on Breaking It All Down and what else I review on that show as well. So go ahead and click on that and back the show. Also, backing the show helps me get the show out more often and improve the production quality of the show, which is good for everybody. Once again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.